Good morning, all. Uh, three things to mention before we start off this morning. Uh, and in one way, they're all linked by the idea of respect. Uh, what uh, I have heard loud and clear uh, over the last few days is how many of you did not feel properly respected uh, as people by those who were your doctors or, or those who were in their political, uh, their political masters. Um, respect we began with by respect for the dead. Uh, and there are, I'm told, about 40 people here today who haven't been uh, at this before. Can I just mention to you again that if you want to show respect for those who are no longer with us, uh, there is uh, a memorial. It's in the chapel. Uh, the chapel is, is not difficult to find. It's not entirely easy, but it's not difficult to find. Uh, and in the middle of the chapel, there is a, a memorial which contains uh, the, the glass jars with messages. If you want to leave a message, there is time to do so. Please feel free uh, in a free moment to do that if you would wish to pay your own respects and have not yet done so. Uh, the, the second matter is, is this. Um, it's outside the, the doors, there, there's a, a small notice, perhaps a bit too small, which says, please don't take photographs. Uh, and the, the purpose of that, it's the sort of uh, notice you see outside many, uh, many event halls, uh, and which you see other people often ignoring, uh, and nothing seems to happen. But there is a particular reason for it uh, in these proceedings, which is that a number of those who are here do not want their photographs to be taken, and certainly don't want them to be posted on the media without their permission. Now that happened uh, overnight. I'm sure that whoever took the photographs uh, meant nothing by it, nothing malign by it, uh, and may simply have missed the, the notice. But could I, I just ask that no photographs are, are taken without the consent of the person being photographed. Uh, the hall has been designed uh, so that, uh, and the, those in, in charge of it have been asked to recognize the, the need to respect people's rights to privacy. So that's the, the second element of rights. And may I say that the press have been very, very good uh, about uh, respecting privacy. You will have seen that they don't take photographs of people without permission. Uh, and I, I thank them in particular for that. It is so easy uh, in a bit of newsreel to pick up people whose faces uh, are there, but who wouldn't want those faces to be shown on the media uh, without their permission. And the, the third matter, I mention it now, um, you will have seen from the program that this afternoon uh, we have people who will be expressing a different perspective uh, on the events of today. If we truly, uh, if you truly, uh, think that you should have had your rights respected by those talking to you, then I'm sure you'll recognize they have a right to have their uh, the expression of their views uh, heard respectfully. I'm sure you will. Uh, I said this at the start. They are people, just as we, you, everyone involved uh, are people. Uh, and I would hope that you will listen to them in silence uh, applause is entirely a matter for you. It is, I don't ask for that. Um, if you feel you wish to give it, then do so. That's your right. But it is their right to be heard with uh, respect. Uh, and I'm sure that you will respect them, uh, just as you have respected, may I say, uh, the very, or very different, the slightly different views uh, that uh, we heard expressed yesterday, different perspectives. Um, not everyone would necessarily agree with everything that was said. Um, but that's for you, uh, and thank you for listening uh, to them. Today we start listening uh, to uh, Stephen Snowden, Queen's Counsel, who, who represents those who have instructed Collins as their legal representatives for the purposes of these, this inquiry. Stephen Snowden.
Sir Brian, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a pleasure to stand here and to be able to speak to you and to address you on behalf of those uh, we represent. Let me explain who we are as I begin. I'm Stephen Snowden with my junior, Brian Cummins. We're instructed by Collins Solicitors. They are a law firm who have inevitably had to do significant amounts of work pro bono on these issues over many years. Who are the people, who are those who I am privileged to represent today? Over 800 individuals, of whom more than 650 are already core participants in this inquiry, a significant cohort of this inquiry. It is expected, we expect, that more will be added as this inquiry moves forward. They are all ages, all backgrounds. They are a true cross-section of society because the treatment disasters with which this inquiry is concerned uh, do not discriminate. They are those who are infected and those who are affected. Amongst the group who instruct me, there are families, bereaved family members, partners, widows, widowers, children, grandchildren. The majority of those who instruct us are haemophiliacs or the family and relatives of haemophiliacs or those infected by intimates, as the expression has it. There are also some who received whole blood transfusions and misdiagnosis. But our largest group of clients are those infected or affected by the administration of factor concentrates. Those who've spoken before me have dwelt on the horror of the symptoms and of the conditions, but we represent those within uh, those who instruct us, uh, a full spectrum of the primary illnesses and diseases that this inquiry will consider, all forms of hepatitis viruses, HIV, CJD, and all of the life-shattering complications of those conditions on which others have already dwelt. In addition, as again others have already said, and I know more than echo, there are the consequential conditions. There is depression. There are cancers. Other lawyers have spoken to you about that, but you yourselves have spoken far more clearly and far more eloquently in the video commemoration from this very stage and directly in conversations around this hall over the last 48 hours. The language you have used of the shadow hanging over each infected person is powerful and sobering. Most of those I represent are members of one of seven campaign groups who have fought for decades and bring much needed and much welcomed expertise to this inquiry. Factor 8, the Birchgrove Group, Fatherless Generation, Forgotten Few, Manor House, Positive Women, and Tainted Blood. It is our privilege to act for them in their pursuit of justice. And I'll come back to that word in a moment. By way of preliminary comments, though, Mr. Chairman, where we appear in the running order after what was said and heard yesterday, what can we sensibly say or add? We do endorse all of what was said to the inquiry yesterday by the various individual and group infected and affected core participants. I hope to avoid repetition this morning, but if I do, please take it as re-emphasis rather than repetition. I'm confident, in light of what's gone before, that I will be less than the full hour allocated to me, and I hope that will assist with your timetable for the rest of the day. At the outset, I want to make four preliminary comments. First, this is the third public inquiry in the United Kingdom. Archer, a private inquiry, no ability to compel witnesses. Penrose in Scotland, in which those infected and affected had no real voice. So Brian, you must understand, and we know that you do, the feeling from those I represent that they've been here before, and there is therefore some caution to our enthusiasm. But we do say at the outset, we enthusiastically welcome this inquiry and intend to work with it. We believe this inquiry is a truly momentous opportunity to deal with matters of the utmost significance, in one sense nationally and politically, in terms of public accountability. 
in terms of our collective conscience as a nation to recognize and acknowledge where wrongs have occurred and coming closer to home on a family and a personal level. This is the first inquiry of this magnitude for this many participants with the power to compel on a UK-wide scale to require documents to be produced, witnesses to be called to account, and for those whose conduct has been questioned to have the opportunity or to be compelled to come forward and tell the truth. It is a very real opportunity to get the answers that people have waited decades for, provided that it continues in the spirit in which we are glad to say it has begun. The nature of the events under scrutiny stretches language to describe, but as Professor Winston said, this is the biggest treatment disaster in the history of the National Health Service. And this is therefore the inquiry which affects more individuals than any other than in British legal history, we believe. Those I represent and the others in this hall have campaigned and waited for decades. They desperately hope it will serve its purpose of achieving justice. That word again, we'll come back to that. Secondly, we bear in mind this is a public inquiry of un previously unseen magnitude and extent. So, so many victims, past, present, and future. Such a period of time to investigate, the investigation not only of the facts and the circumstances of infection, but of how individuals and their families were treated medically and socially. The investigation of how their persistent attempts to know, to understand, and to obtain justice have been rebuffed, have been pushed back, and have been covered up, we believe. And now is the time for that conduct to stop and for decency to prevail. Thirdly, we bear in mind that this is an opening. It is the start. It is a beginning. We do not yet have the documents or the evidence. There are many theories, suspicions, and concerns. None is yet tested or probed forensically in public, and we are very grateful that that opportunity is afforded us. We therefore tread lightly over some of the detail now, but rest assured, we expect it to be scrutinized fully in the course of this inquiry. This is an opening statement, and we are responsible enough to wait for evidence to be seen, heard, and tested before reaching conclusions on it. Fourthly, We've already heard many personal stories and personal accounts. We will hear more today. You've seen some in the commemoration. Some of you have spoken to the press. Many, Mr. Chairman, we know have spoken directly to you. We recognize and are grateful that the inquiry has indeed taken the time and the care to meet with individuals and to put them at the heart of this inquiry. Let me tell you what I'm going to tell you over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. What will I say in this opening? First of all, we welcome this opportunity at an early stage to have a voice heard and to engage in dialogue about what matters to us for this inquiry going forward. I will therefore say something about how the inquiry must go about its work, we suggest. Each and every single one of the terms of reference is vital, but Mr. Chairman, we know you've invited our thoughts on that and we will emphasize a few and add some observations. And I will conclude with some practical and procedural comments, but I will follow the pattern set by others before me who spoke yesterday and leave detailed submissions on certain areas to another occasion. But let me come back to the word I mentioned twice, justice. Those I represent seek justice. It's easy to say the purpose of this inquiry is to achieve justice. What does that mean? Those I represent have fought and fought and campaigned and asked and inquired and sought clarity and sought redress and demanded this inquiry after doors were slammed in their faces. And their overwhelming common experience is of having been ignored, sidelined, belittled by those in authority. Without exception, they are all individuals who placed their trust in medical professionals. This, of course, was in the context of the 1970s and the 1980s, and the prevailing view that doctors, like others in authority in those decades, were always right. We know that is not the case. That was eloquently expounded yesterday by David Locke, QC, in the context of Hillsborough, if you recall, he talked to us about that, where after years 
the families were eventually proved right, and the state was proved wrong, and then wrong, and then wrong again several times, until eventually justice prevailed. Those I represent who placed their trust in medical professionals then placed their trust in government. That trust has also been abused. Those individuals feel disempowered. Their trust is broken. I would like to take us one stage further in the Hillsborough story than David Locke took us yesterday, beyond the conclusion of the inquest. The former Bishop of Liverpool, who I know many of you have met, the Right Reverend James Jones, was commissioned in the wake of the final Hillsborough inquest by the Prime Minister when she was Home Secretary to report on the experience of the ordinary members of the public who were victims. His report, produced in November last year, is called, forgive the language, but this is it, The Patronising Disposition of Unaccountable Power. I'd like to quote from two paragraphs from his introductory letter. The bishop writes, Over the last two decades, as I have listened to what the families have endured, a phrase has formed in my mind to describe what they have come up against whenever they have sought to challenge those in authority. The patronising disposition of unaccountable power. Those authorities have been both in the public and in the private sector. The Hillsborough families, he recognises, are not the only ones who have suffered from the patronising disposition of unaccountable power. The families know there are others who have found that when in all innocence and with good conscience they have asked questions of those in authority on behalf of those they love, the institution has closed ranks refused to disclose information, used public money to defend its interests, and acted in a way which was both intimidating and oppressive. Pausing. Does that sound familiar? And so he carries on. The Hillsborough family's struggle to gain justice for the 96 has a vicarious quality to it, so that whatever they can achieve in calling to account those of authority is of value to the whole nation. That we suggest, is very much the sense of what we, and you in this hall, have been told time and time again by those I represent. It has been their experience too. And that, we use another simple word for it, is wrong. When I say that, I don't mean a lawyer's textbook definition of a crime or of negligence. But in the mind of any right-thinking person, it is simply wrong that that occurred. It should not have happened. So how do we define the justice that we, they, you seek? First, it must be based on knowledge. Full access to the facts and information is the foundation of achieving justice in this inquiry. Those I represent are demanding to know what actually happened for individuals and on the wider stage in the medical, the commercial and the political sphere. I'll come back to that in a moment. What actually happened at the time when factor concentrates were introduced, when the alarm bells ought to have rung. And what then happened, or was covered up when they began to ask perfectly proper questions. We want to see and hear the truth, the unvarnished full truth. We don't want redacted documents. We don't want privilege or public interest immunity to be claimed. And we're grateful that you, sir, have made it clear you don't want that either. But I'll mention in a moment how that device or those devices continue to be deployed even today. So we need to know the full truth of what happened. We then need to have what was done analyzed to understand what ought to have happened instead and to have that stated openly. There needs to be accountability, there needs to be redress, and there needs to be no way that this, and by this we mean not only the initial infection, but what we do not hesitate to call the cover-up which followed it can happen again. Let me come back to the, Reverend, the Right Reverend James Jones. In November 2017, as I say, he published his report. He recommended a document to public bodies. That document is called the Charter for Families Bereaved Through Public Tragedy. And I pause to mention bereaved could equally be read as infected uh, in this case. Unfortunately, it is not clear to us whether the public bodies represented in this inquiry have yet committed to that charter. 
Because this should not be an inquiry dealing with bodies who are closing doors in our faces or holding them ajar only on their terms, but an inquiry with public bodies and government positively welcoming the opportunity to engage with us and with the inquiry and to be frank. They should be welcoming it genuinely, fully, far more than lip service. This is a public tragedy, in the sense Bishop James was describing. And the things he says about the perspective of the bereaved and the injured must not be lost. As I say, his charter is a document which he encourages public bodies to sign up to and to commit in six points that they will do the following. Point one, in the event of a public tragedy, activate its emergency plan, deploy its resources to rescue victims, but listen to this, to support the bereaved and to protect the vulnerable. Let's pause and put that in our experience of what's happened here. In this context, we do question the activities of the so-called charitable trusts, the extent of their support for the bereaved, the equality of their support, and their protection of the vulnerable. Point two of the bishop's six points. Public bodies should place the public interest above their own reputation. Again, pause and apply that to our situation. Those who I represent say, do not be defensive. Do not obstruct this process. Do not withhold documents. Do not lie to us anymore. Do not seek to mislead the chair of this inquiry. Do not tamper with documents. Do not stall. Do not be slow to comply. Volunteer, be proactive with documents, be proactive with witnesses for this chair and this team. We, the infected and affected, demand no less. The bishop's third point in his charter, which he encourages public bodies to adopt, is this. They should approach forms of public scrutiny, including public inquiries and inquests, with candor in an open, honest and transparent way making full disclosure of relevant documents, material, and facts. They should endorse this sentence, our objective is to assist the search for truth. Let me reread that. Our objective is to assist the search for truth. And we look to those public bodies and we say, can you say that is what you have done in the past? Can you undertake that that is now what you will proactively do? This is not a witch hunt, but we do want you, the public bodies, to view this as an opportunity to be honest. The bishop's fourth point, avoid seeking to defend the indefensible or dismiss or disparage those who may have suffered where we have fallen short. Let's apply that to ourselves. We suggest that they should not stigmatize those innocent communities any longer. Point five. The bishop suggests public bodies should ensure all members of staff treat members of the public and each other with respect and courtesy. Where they fall short, they should apologize straightforwardly and genuinely. And we say for this inquiry, they must respect the entitlement of people to know they must own up and not hide. The bishop's sixth point, recognize that they are accountable and open to challenge. Being accountable is not an end in itself. It's the first step in learning, in changing, and in putting right. So we draw those six points together, and we say the time has now come for the defensive and self-exculpatory attitude of the public bodies to end. It cannot be right that those who are or were employed by the state, in that sense to serve us all, protect their own interests. We do not know, as I say, whether any of those represented bodies who will speak after me this afternoon have signed up to that charter. If not, we challenge them to do so. May I turn? May I turn to what I'm, I've put forward as how the inquiry should go about its work, and I've called this mindset and context. We suggest the inquiry must bear in mind the time and the attitudes. It must bear in mind, secondly, the complete innocence of those infected and affected. And it must look with skepticism at what I will call the narrative of necessity. And I'll explain that in a moment. But first, 
to put the, in the context the inquiry should operate in, the time and the attitudes, in order properly to understand the experience and the suffering of these individuals and families, the inquiry must consider the time and the social attitudes when this occurred. All those whose infection became public knowledge suffered huge stigma of a sort which is almost impossible to conceive in the changed world and the changed social understanding we exist in today. And that stigma, of course, compounded their medical suffering. Let me, forgive me if I tell you one story of uh, a history relayed to us at this inquiry by one of the core participants I represent. His story is this, age three, diagnosed as haemophiliac, prescribed factor concentrate, diagnosed with hepatitis C. Age 16, diagnosis of HIV. A vulnerable, troubled teenager believing his life was over, going off the rails. Pulled back, if I may use the expression, by the love of a good woman. Age 21, after nine months, having to go through with her the fear and anguish of having to tell her about his illness. Frightened of what she would do relieved to discover that she stood by him, but then with her support undergoing a repeat of that fear and anguish in telling her parents before they married. As an adult applying for jobs, mentioning his diagnosis of haemophilia, but not the diagnoses of HIV or hepatitis for fear of stigma and prejudice. Now in his 40s, he receives what for many would be the crippling blow of being diagnosed with cancer. But in his case, it was what he described as a strange relief to realize that this was an illness he could actually tell people about, not something he felt he had to hide. Can we contemplate that? How has it come to that? These are the sorts of experiences the inquiry must understand, and we know, sir, that you try to do so, to fully comprehend what has been suffered. And I emphasize this is not limited to those with HIV AIDS, those who suffered other conditions, most notably hepatitis, face stigma and abuse from its association with intravenous drug use and with alcohol. So that's the time and the attitudes in their context, I hope. Secondly, the complete innocence of those infected and affected. These are entirely innocent individuals whose trust in the state has been broken. It is essential the inquiry is full and fearless, and we and all the other core participants represented today are determined to ensure that it will be. These are not as sometimes caricatured, grasping, complaining claimants seeking a financial lottery. They are not a nuisance. They are not just a thorn in the side of successive governments or the medical profession. Their stories are horrific. Their suffering is genuine. It was entirely avoidable, and they've been ignored. They deserve the certainty of future peace of mind and dignity. Peace of mind for those infected, for those they love, for, for instance, the mothers and fathers diagnosed who have had to ask themselves, what will happen to my children? For the wives and widows infected and affected. For their children who should have been and the grief at their loss. Innocent. Thirdly, the narrative of necessity as I described it. What do I mean by that? That is the narrative sometimes put forward that factor concentrates were some form of necessary groundbreaking treatment which simply had to be developed and deployed. We suggest that is simply untrue. Perhaps it was indeed put forward to its recipients as a wonder drug. But those I represent consider the question of whether it was truly needed when balanced against the risks, and the risks of viral infection in blood had long been recognized. That question was not asked or was not asked sufficiently clearly. While perhaps more cumbersome, the existing haemophilia treatment of cryoprecipitate was effective and, importantly, significantly safer. It did not have to be superseded then by factor concentrates. It was not inherently dangerous. It came from single donors, not from combinations of thousands, as factor concentrates did, where the risk is multiplied exponentially. We do not accept that there was insufficient cryoprecipitate to go around, or the production could not have been increased if necessary. The shift from voluntary single donors to buying factor concentrates, in effect commoditizing blood products, had what we consider and what we believe this inquiry will establish conclusively to 
bring with it entirely foreseeable risk. Others yesterday identified the knowledge. They touched on evidence you saw on the screen, documents, which we believe will ultimately compel the inquiry to conclude the risks of blood-borne viruses were known and appreciated in the decades before the early 1970s. Put another way, we believe that it is going to be shown as no more than an urban myth that haemophiliacs would have died without this product, or that in most cases it was an essential or a life-saving treatment. The issue, we are grateful, the, the issue of self-sufficiently, in fact, to concentrates will be looked at in detail. The promise of David Owen, as he then was in 1974-75, to achieve it never came to pass, as we know. We know and are grateful that the inquiry has in mind to investigate that. The country was, of course, self-sufficient in whole blood, which was not imported or purchased. We suggest that the use of existing medicine and science could have continued until there was complete confidence in the new science of the factor concentrates or until heat treatment could be developed, which, as we all know, is in the region of 1985, although there are questions why that was not sooner. Or it could, at any stage, have been reverted to. And if so, thousands of infections and needless deaths would have been avoided. Any sense that this was a developing science which was essential, so much so that lives could be risked by implementing it, must, we say, be absolutely rejected. May I turn to some of the practical aspects we urge, with the greatest of respect, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, and on the Chancellor to the inquiry, of how to go about your work. The first of those points is thoroughness. A key concern of all of our clients is the thoroughness of this inquiry. In litigation, in court cases, there is the concept of dealing with cases not only justly, but proportionately, by which they mean applying in just enough resources to make it sensible to do. We say that is not appropriate here. It is not appropriate to restrict the nature or the extent of the inquiry in that way. But even if a proportionality test were to be applied, the immense significance of this inquiry and what it is investigating demands the very greatest measure of time and resource. We strongly encourage thoroughness ahead of speed. We believe it is better to reach the right conclusion more slowly than the wrong conclusion quickly. Second point on how the inquiry should go about its work and practical aspects, the obtaining and preserving of documents and of medical records. We all recognize the inquiry must obtain and preserve and make available to all and facilitate access to any and all relevant documents. On a macro level, a large level, by which we mean government and public bodies documents, but also on a micro level, by which I mean personal documents. On the bigger stage, on a macro or a bureaucratic level, many of those we represent as we recognize many of the other core participants represented by others do too, have devoted considerable amounts of time and developed real skill in harrying, pursuing the obtaining of government documents. But there are still what appear to be hindrances to individuals getting documents from the Public Records Office, from the National Archive, even in their own personal access to records departments at hospitals let alone government departments. We are encouraged to hear that notices of retention and non-destruction of documents have been delivered, responded to, and are believed to be being acted on. But are they? So far as we're aware, those letters have been sent to NHS bodies. That's what we see from the inquiry's website. And we are encouraged to hear counsel to the inquiry talking about documents being sought from health boards responsible for haemophilia centers, from the Haemophilia Society, from various trusts, and from what she referred to only as five large pharmaceutical companies. It must be right also that any and all documentation from and produced by the HIV haemophilia litigation in 1989-1990 and its settlement should be sought and disclosed, as that clearly falls within the terms of reference. Now, we understand the Department of Health have an effective system of electronic filing, or at least of electronic cataloguing, which can be searched easily. But we do suggest that documents must also be sought from the Treasury. We understand they have the same effective system of electronic filing or cataloguing to allow relatively easy access. We would expect the Treasury to have documents relating to the financial implications 
and any cost-benefit analysis. And that's important to know. That will be important to know. We also suggest that documents must be sought from the Foreign Office for contact with US authorities and with overseas pharmaceutical companies. But at present, the Foreign Office tell those of us who've inquired that they must search manually through paper files. Freedom of information requests are refused on the basis that the provision of the information would be disproportionate. It costs them too much to do it. We also respectfully suggest that documents must be sought from the Cabinet Office, where we believe critical decisions were made in respect of, for instance, the HIV litigation. Let me give one example of issues on the larger, the macro, the bureaucratic scale. One of the core participants I represent um, asked under freedom of information for lists of files where certain keywords appear in their title. That's how one does it. Many of you in this room will know. As a result, he obtained a full list of file titles and the dates those files covered. He therefore became aware of the existence of a treasury file. Not a Department of Health, but a Treasury file, dated December 1991 and entitled Health Risks and Special Initiatives, Haemophiliacs and Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Now that, on the face of it, looks, doesn't it, as if it would be relevant to the issues. He asked for that full file. He received a response that he was not entitled. It would be too expensive to produce it, according to the test. So then he changed tack, and he asked just for the first 20 pages. How could that be disproportionately expensive? That was in May 2018. He received a standard form acknowledgement from the Treasury. In June, he then pointed out the time for his request to be complied with had expired. The response simply said, your request still being considered. We're sorry for the delay. He chased again for an update at the end of July. He received the same sort of apology in August. He chased again in mid-August. Frustrated, he then changed tack and with commendable determination, put in a freedom of information request for all government emails discussing his previous request for those 20 pages. He wanted to know what had gone on. In return, he got 30 pages of emails between the Treasury and the Cabinet Office discussing simply how to respond to his request for 20 pages of documents. But those 30 pages of emails suggest that not the 20 pages should not be provided because they mention something, a lot. And that something, whether it's a name, whether it's a process, whatever it may be, is redacted from the emails he's received. So that illustrates, Mr. Chairman, the difficulties that individuals face. We desperately hope that public bodies are more cooperative with the inquiry than with individuals. But what are we to think of that? What is any fair-minded observer to think of that? And let me come briefly on a micro or a personal level and give you one more account. Maybe the experience of some of you sat in this hall. One of the core participants yesterday told us that his father, one of the infected, died when he was 11. His mother paid 240 pounds for his medical records and got 600 pages in a file. He read through them and he recognised there are cross-references to other records, so this set wasn't complete. So he went back to the hospital, where it was indeed recognised that there, were another, there was another file of 600 pages, but astonishingly, the hospital's first reaction was to suggest that because he was not his father, his dead father, he couldn't get those records. They relented on that, but then, and this is important, they would not relent from further payment for the additional records. And he was told there's a system for destruction of old records. Fortunately for him, these were just about coming up for destruction in November of this year. So if he could hang on a bit and go back in November, he could get them without having to pay the fee because they would otherwise just be destroyed. Now that, we respectfully suggest, is an utterly unacceptable attitude and suggests that some trusts have not understood or implemented uh, the clear guidance issued by this inquiry. So that illustrates on a personal level how difficult it still is for individuals to obtain their records even this month when the inquiry has started. And there are still problems with trusts destroying individuals' records. And we do encourage the inquiry again and again to bring to the attention of health trusts what is expected of them. 
May I turn to a third aspect of practical points for how this, we respectfully suggest the inquiry should go about its business, and that is to do with commercial concerns. As I observed a moment ago, counsel to the inquiry mentioned in her opening that documents were being sought from five pharmaceutical companies, unnamed. We note that none is represented today, so far as we know, nor, to our knowledge, is any a core participant. She did not name them. Their names, or at least the names under which, as a matter of fact, they traded and manufactured or supplied factor concentrates in the 70s or 80s, are well known to those in this hall. We express the hope that formal approaches from the inquiry will not attract what I can describe as a heavy-handed response from successor companies to references private individuals make in the press or in the public to the roles they historically played. We desperately hope the inquiry will obtain their documents. It seems to us imperative that their role is investigated and to the utmost extent that the rules and the jurisdiction of this inquiry will allow, bearing in mind that companies change, we know that, as a matter of record. But we urge this inquiry to obtain and disclose all relevant documents it can from private and commercial concerns, to require evidence from witnesses who were in any role of significance in decision-making in those private or commercial concerns at the material times. The issues to us are obvious. They will have evidence that relates to the developing science and their knowledge and their appreciation of risk. They will be able to assist with the influence they exerted over medical professionals, directors of haemophilia centers, and others. They will be able to assist with the issues of independence and incentivization, both personal and professional. The fourth area we suggest the inquiry could productively look at, uh, which isn't mentioned much in the documentation so far, and there may be a good reason, and we'll, we'll deal with that if we may, is the Blood Products Laboratory. This is one entity we understand now is a private con commercial concern, but it was not at the material time. It was the Blood Pro Products Laboratory. It isn't directly mentioned in the terms of reference, but its role is very important, of course, as we know, in understanding the issues of self-sufficiency. We suggest that the inquiry and scrutiny of the roles of the Blood Products Laboratory at Elstree, the Plasma Fractionation Laboratory in Oxford, and the Protein Fractionation Centre in Edinburgh is required. We know they were unable to meet demand. And then commercial factor concentrates began to be purchased from the USA, despite risk. Self-sufficiency, of course, was raised uh, as an objective by David Irwin in 1974-75. But despite being funding being provided, it was still not achieved by its target of 1977, or, or at all. And the question is, why not? And the answer will in part lie, we suspect, uh, with material from the Blood Products Laboratory. We know there were significant problems at the BPL in the late 70s and early 80s. Expansion was pursued in 1981, and a change of management and a change of control to the NHS. Uh, necessary increases in UK capacity were still not obtained, though, attained. And products continued to be imported despite the known concerns. Criticism was made of its management in a 1981 draft paper as being too diffuse, fragmented responsibility, insufficiently and not continuously coordinated. Those responsible have very little experience of managing facilities of the kind concerned. Uh, the directors of the laboratory are required to work without adequate policy guidance and without sufficient expert monitoring of their laboratory's performance. Now, shamefully, that paper was severely redacted by officials before submission to ministers. But we want to know who did this and why, so that we can understand how things really were then. We know expansion work at the Blood Products Laboratory was only completed in 87. Meanwhile, the existing plant continued its production, relying on Crown immunity to uh, dispense with all the requirements of the Medicines Act. But it was able to meet only about 40% of national requirements. Lord Owen followed up his initial request for self-sufficiency, but was informed there had been no maladministration. We say there are obvious areas to be explored. May I move on? Another area for the inquiry to dwell on, we hope, is witness statements. Now, we do understand this is the chance for each person to give their account and for each person to be heard. For those represented by solicitors, we do believe it is anticipated that solicitors can be involved in taking detailed witness statements cross-referenced to medical records, cross-referenced to other existing documents so that they are as accurate as possible. We do ask, though, whether it is right to have that account given to 
for those not represented by lawyers, to an investigator for the inquiry in a simple narrative form. Sit down, tell me your story. That's where it must start, but accounts must be cross-referenced to that individual's medical records or to the records of the relative who was infected. Recollection of dates and events of 30 years or more ago will inevitably be uncertain and prone to error. And for this inquiry, the timeline and the numbers are important, as will be drawing inferences from any individual's medical records. It may well be that trends will emerge from references in medical records to treatment, decisions, recommendations. In the main sphere in which I practice of medical and personal injuries law, we know how difficult it is for even the most diligent and determined solicitor to obtain and piece together an individual's full medical records, especially in cases of complicated or multiple conditions treated at different hospitals or clinics. So we do suggest that for those not represented by solicitors, thought should be given by the inquiry to someone on the inquiry team, carefully cross-checking the completeness and the accuracy of each individual's records as obtained and pursuing any omissions uh, quickly and thoroughly. May I turn for a moment to talk about resources, fairness, and parity of representation. Now, this is not just a moan. We have a real concern about resources. As has been said by others who stood here before me, as lawyers, we do not see this inquiry as an income-generating exercise. On the contrary, as others have said, significant amounts of work have been undertaken pro bono, which is a delightful lawyer's expression, meaning for free or for good. And I gratefully upset, uh, uh, adopt what was said by Mr. O'Neill QC for the Scottish core participants about core participants consciously limiting their role and their attendance and their representation to the issues that directly concern them. But I do and must mention only this. The fact that the infected and affected core participants are receiving public funds leads by a budget or a cap on rates and hours to an inevitable restriction on their representation. That is true, whether it's considered that cap is fair or not. I pause to observe that the government bodies who are also core participants in this inquiry are in truth also spending public funds on their representation, but without, so far as we are aware, any cap or budgetary limit or limit on hours. And we do invite the inquiry. This is not an easy area we recognize, but to consider it carefully. We appreciate this is not a court case. There are no parties. So expressions like parity of arms are inappropriate. We absolutely recognize that. But we do suggest that it is fundamentally wrong in a public inquiry of this magnitude to put individual core participants in a position where those representing them either have to down tools when the budget is reached, leave the work undone, the representations underprepared, or act pro bono when government body core participants do not face those restrictions. There should be a level playing field. I say that carefully. We are entirely in favour of transparency over funding and resources, and we do hope to carry this conversation on with the inquiry team over the next days and weeks. Let me turn briefly to the terms of reference. Some additional points, some areas of emphasis. Those we represent are clear in communicating to us and inviting us to communicate to you that they welcome the detail of the terms of reference and they welcome the inquiry into each and every aspect identified. So this, therefore, is without reducing the emphasis on all the others, I mention only a few. To us, the key issues, the key issues of initial infection seem simple. What's in your terms of reference is 1C. What was or ought to have been known of the risks? 1H. Why were people given? And how did they come to be given? Infected factor concentrates. Issues 9A and 9B, then, the issues of cover-up. And then that leads logically to issue 8 including the terms of litigation settlement, about how a civilized society should react to those events. Under paragraph five of the terms of reference, uh, we welcome the inquiry into tissue samples being kept, sent, or tested without consent, and particularly the testing of previously untreated patients, PUP is the acronym, unnecessarily as guinea pigs. Those are both going to be detailed, historical, document-intensive areas, and we welcome them as areas of inquiry. We've already mentioned the role of the blood, products forgive me, the blood products laboratory to be considered, and we suggest its failure to recall batches for heat treatment when others were already doing so, explored to a limited extent in previous inquiries, 
clearly warrants attention. We think this falls under 1H and 1I. Commercial influence. We are pleased to see that under various of the terms of reference, 1C, 1G and 1H, we believe that this is a key issue not adequately considered before. We venture to suggest another one, correcting or reopening inquest verdicts. This may fall under terms of reference 9. This is one area where the proper and accurate recognition of someone's passing, their cause of death, might assist with a sense of closure and recognition of what happened and resolution for those left behind. The death certificates of many who die of HIV AIDS do not say so. They often refer to pneumonia as the primary cause of death. They almost never refer to factor products. You've heard others endorse the view that doctors were keen to play down the role of contaminated factor concentrates. Death certificates often refer to cirrhosis rather than hepatitis. So we suggest that as this area is explored, the inquiry could usefully work perhaps with the chief coroner to give guidance for the future and guidance, if appropriate, for the reopening or revising of past inquest conclusions. Under terms of reference nine, a very significant concern of those we represent is the extent to which they are now driven to depend on the state for their financial subsistence. They talk heartbreakingly about the indignity and the shame of having to apply to re-justify entitlement and, in effect, beg for charity. Those concerns were eloquently put in the commemoration video presentation. The actions, the capricious decision-making and the inexplicable inconsistency and inequality of support in the different parts of the UK is disturbing and demands urgent consideration. Points expressed firmly to us include the makeup, the constitution, the historical actions of the many trusts, including the McFarlane Trust and the Skipton Trust, and the different unequal welfare payments and entitlements, depending on which arbitrary category you fall into, and the trustees' subjective discretion. It was mentioned yesterday, we endorse that as being key concern to those we represent. Also, the fact these trusts and bodies were set up to be arm's length vehicles by which successive governments could say that they were meeting the needs of the infected and affected, but without any admission of liability and without taking direct responsibility for their decisions and the provision they made. As I've said, the markedly different financial provision in England, Scotland and Wales expressed to us firmly is the view that the McFarlane Trust effectively acted illegally and continues to do so as a credit broker taking equity release charges over people's properties. And there are, we are told, significant problems and ongoing problems with the new statutory body. Now at present we understand from the possible timeline outlined by counsel to the inquiry that hearing, inquiring into those parts of the terms of reference, that's the provision and the trusts, may not start until Easter 2020. If so, we may not arrive at recommendations for change, even by way of interim recommendations, until the latter part of 2020, two years hence. That, we suggest, is too far away. And this is one aspect of the inquiry which we think could be extracted and expedited as far as possible. If, for instance, the issues of immediate need, eligibility, and appropriate levels of support were taken out from the consideration of the historical position without for one moment belittling the need to investigate what the trusts have done, it should be possible, we would suggest, perhaps with the benefit of limited oral evidence, perhaps with written representations, to make early recommendations about changes to the level of financial provision. And we commend that course to the inquiry. Finally, a few practical and procedural points. Fully electronic disclosure, we welcome that. That's the only way this inquiry will work properly. Mr. Stein QC yesterday suggested building an electronic timeline or a chronology to be available to the core participants, to which the documents that are disclosed could be linked and marked appropriately. That will clearly avoid potential disputes over the dates and the significance of those documents. It will lead most clearly to the inquiry and the public understanding what should have been appreciated by whom and when. It's right to dismiss previous government chronologies, the now discredited and now disavowed report on self-sufficiency in blood products in England and Wales, chronology 73 to 91. The timeline in this inquiry must be clear, objective, and beyond reproach. So, subject to safeguards of marking the sources of original copies, recognizing that different versions of the same documents, some annotated perhaps, may exist, 
And returning originals to those core participants who provided them, the individual core participants, uh, we absolutely commend that approach to the inquiry. The idea of the chair sitting without assessors, we express our very firm provisional support for that. The idea of working with groups of experts, again, we express our provisional support, but that's already in motion. We know that experts are beginning to be appointed provisionally. We heard that at the end of last week. We look forward to working with the inquiry and other core participants on that, but we've had almost no time to consider names already promulgated. It may be, and I say this with great caution, that there are some concerns to be raised over some names identified already. It's right to say no more publicly at this stage, nor to go into specifics, but we will liaise with others, other interested parties, other core participants, and liaise with the inquiry as soon as possible. Let me finish. You may be grateful I'm going to finish. Let me finish by summing up what we've said. We have optimism, but we hope you understand it is cautious optimism for this inquiry. We are determined to work constructively with you and your team. We describe what we mean when we say we seek justice from this inquiry. We challenge the public bodies which are core participants to comply with the Right Reverend Jones's Hillsborough Charter. We have suggested the mindset the inquiry should adopt to remember the context of the 70s and 80s, to debunk, if I may use that expression, the caricaturing of those infected and affected, to debunk the narrative of factor of concentrates having been necessary treatment. We have, I hope, made some practical suggestions of how the inquiry might go about its work and some emphasize some of the terms of reference. May I, will you forgive me if I share one more story so that you may see the resilience of some of our, those we now represent. I stress this is a true story and my junior counsel has insisted I share it. Um, a core participant spoke to him yesterday. He was diagnosed with hepatitis. He was placed on medical treatments which included pig's blood and Chinese cat's ovaries. Those are new treatments to me. He attended his consultant, who sadly told him he may also have variant CJD. He said to his doctor, I'm on pig's blood, cat's ovaries, and now you're saying I could have my cow disease. He said, yes, I'm afraid that's right. And with the resilience, he responded, is it a doctor I need or a vet? <laughs> I haven't made that up, that's not me. That's one of you, and only people who have been touched by sadness and tragedy can display that sense of humor. The dignity, perseverance, and dogged commitment of those in this hall to getting to the truth must be matched by the inquiry. These have been an emotional, somber few days, but we can build on this moving forward. Finally, I'm going to close by returning to the report of Bishop Jones. Uh, take the liberty of adopting and adapting what he said at the end of his introduction. He said this, people talk too loosely about closure. They fail to recognize there can be no closure to love, nor should there be for someone you have loved and lost. Grief is a journey without a destination. The bereaved, and in this context, we expand that to include the infected and affected, travel through a landscape of memories and thoughts of what might have been. It's a journey marked by milestones, some you seek, some you stumble on. For the families and survivors of this tragedy, those milestones do include the search for truth, accountability, and justice. And we look to the inquiry to provide those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Snowden. We now have Kaz Chalice, please. everyone, Sir Brian. I'm sorry we all have reason to be here, but goodness, I have met some amazing people here over the last few days. 
First of all, I'd like to say how relieved I am that the, this inquiry is finally underway. It's been such a long time coming, and sadly, as we know, it's come too late for many people. I hope it will uncover the truth of what happened and will bring justice and some degree of closure to all those who've lost loved ones and to all those of us who are still here dealing with the life-changing effects of contaminated blood. I'd like to thank Sir Brian and the inquiry team for their good work so far in making sure that we are finally heard and for handing us the talking stick. The terms of reference seem to be comprehensive and inclusive of everyone affected and what we had asked for. The inquiry team have come across as approachable, compassionate and responsive to our needs as a whole community. From what I've understood so far, this inquiry team are determined to get to the bottom of this terrible scandal that has taken and ruined so many lives. And this will, of course, be the main focus of the investigation. I appreciate that this process of searching for the truth and justice needs to be thorough, but given how much time has been lost already, I hope that it will be as efficient and fast moving as possible. My personal interest in the inquiry is twofold. I'm here as a person who was infected with hepatitis C through NHS treatment. And I'm also here because of my voluntary work in hepatitis C advocacy and my desire to support others affected by contaminated blood. I'm here with a righteous anger for all those who are infected with HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and other blood-borne viruses when the blood products and treatments they were given were known to be risky. We need justice for the haemophiliacs who received infected blood products and for all those people who received infected blood transfusions, anti-D and other blood products. I hope this inquiry will expose any cover-ups that occurred, which we know they did, and will help all of those affected, many of whom lack medical evidence as a result of these cover-ups to be heard. My personal focus is on hepatitis C simply because that is what I know. I was infected with hepatitis C myself through cancer interventions, which included a blood transfusion in early 1992. I want to stress that I am very grateful to my brilliant medical team for saving my life several times over, and I direct no blame towards any of them. Their care was the very best. However, a result, as a result of the cancer and the subsequent infection with hepatitis C, my life over the last 20 years, 26 years, has not been an easy ride. I was cured of hepatitis C by taking part in the clinical trial of Ecclusa in 2015, but by then, I had already lost my quality of life and most of my working years, including my career as a therapeutic counsellor. And I have never had any acknowledgement or support for my loss of earnings and pension. I still have chronic fatigue. I've been humiliated time and time again, like many others, having to jump through hoops at work capability assessments trying to prove that I simply cannot work due to the chronic fatigue and other long-term effects of my illness and treatments, even though I may look fine. This awful treatment of sick people needs to change for all those affected, and I would like the inquiry to look at this issue. I have never received any financial help from the Skipton Fund or any other schemes, such as the English Infected Blood Support Scheme, because I did not meet their strict criteria regarding dates of infection. My application to the Skipton Fund in 2004 was rejected. And when I appealed this decision in closing supporting letters from two consultants, both of whom asked for leniency regarding the harsh and arbitrary cutoff dates, I was refused again. I am far more upset about this than I am about the fact that I was accidentally infected. So one of the things that I would like to see this inquiry focus on 
is the examination of the various schemes criteria to make sure that they are inclusive of all infected and that they don't discriminate against those of us who are infected in healthcare settings through negligence or accidentally, especially after they began screening blood in September 1991. I'd like the inquiry to consider whether we need more education and awareness regarding the prevention of transmission, both in the community and in medical and clinical settings, so that accidents don't happen. In my case, hepatitis C slipped through the net a few months after they began screening. I know there will be many others in my situation who've been infected post-September 1991 who either don't know and who consequently cannot get any acknowledgement or financial and emotional support. As a result of my own intensive study of hepatitis C during my search for knowledge, support and treatment, I now work voluntarily in hepatitis C advocacy mainly in a large international on online peer support group. I interact daily with sick people struggling to get the same information, support and treatment for themselves. And so I am here also as a campaigner for change in how we deal with hepatitis C. Therefore, I would like this inquiry to consider the current state of hepatitis C care in the UK and to consider how it might be improved upon so that we can raise awareness, reduce stigma, and get people tested and treated quickly. We know the look-back exercise was woefully inadequate, and we know that people are still finding out that they were infected with contaminated blood decades after the event, causing extreme trauma, and meaning that many find out they have hepatitis C when it is already too late to save them from complications and liver damage. We also know that there are thousands of people out there, far more than the official estimates, who will never find out until it's too late for them. I would like to see the NHS testing every single person for hepatitis C. It's not an expensive test. and then quickly treating those who test positive. This is the only way we will find them all. The recent rationing of treatment by the NHS was a cruel blow to those wait waiting patiently for the new direct act acting antivirals, antivirals to become available. And I personally know of some people who were given the older, cheaper, harsher interferon and ribavirin treatments as they were not deemed sick enough yet to merit the newer, very expensive ones. The government has pledged to eliminate hepatitis C by 2025, but that will never happen unless everyone affected is found, diagnosed and treated quickly. However, drug pricing currently is prohibitive. So perhaps ways must be found either to persuade drug companies to lower their prices or for the much, much cheaper generic equivalent medicines which work perfectly well to be purchased by the NHS. I hope this inquiry will consider what recommendations should be made in order for the tens of thousands of the unfound to be found, tested and treated. There is a serious lack of education and awareness in the UK about hepatitis C. Most lay people have never heard of it. If they have heard of it, it's likely they will have preconceptions about how it might be caught. Therefore, many people with hepatitis C feel marginalized and afraid to speak out. I'd like this inquiry to consider the role of education in reducing the fear and stigma associated with hepatitis C and we've heard a lot about the stigma this morning. And to address the need for better practical and emotional support systems for those affected. So finally, this government should look back, accept accountability and make amends to those affected by contaminated blood as far as they are able. 
it should also look forward to ensure that this preventable disease is understood, identified, treated and finally eliminated in the UK. The lack of integrity shown by the government is in stark contrast to the tangible integrity in this room. I hope this inquiry's investigations will provide the framework and guidance for the work that lies ahead. Thank you. We'll now take a 20-minute break until 25 to 12.